And now I will introduce our speakers. Beth Buffington, during her 30 years she spent working as a professional architect, Beth enjoyed working with many talented landscape professionals and also gardening as a hobby. She has learned to appreciate how a connection with nature and the environment can bring satisfaction and pleasure to many people. As a master gardener, she hopes to share her love of gardening with others. Ann Coddington is a member of MGNV class of 2015. She is interested in soil health, medicinal uses of plants, and creating a tiny native woodland habitat in her backyard. Liz Crowley is a structural engineer that is passionate about house plants, especially begonias, which she grows in her greenhouse. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. And with that, I will turn it over to Beth. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you all for joining us. So we hope to help you understand some of the parameters of a residential greenhouse today. The first part of the presentation is the basics. It's sort of, I would call it the design section. How big is your greenhouse? What, what do you want to do with it? The middle section is very much a technical section. If you've already decided to get a greenhouse, what do you need in it? What do you need to consider? The third section is our case studies from our two other gardeners who own greenhouses. And then there's a little piece at the end that's called the romance of the greenhouse. I'm an architect. I see greenhouses as a specialized little building, but they're very much like other buildings. And in many ways, they're not like other buildings. I'm fascinated by the history of the greenhouse. They started being built in the 1700s when exotic plants were being brought overseas into other countries. So for instance, there are a lot of plants in the United States that were being shipped over to England and really transformative for the flora that was available in England. In Germany and in Holland and in England, their climatic conditions were very different. They're being brought in exotic plants from South Pacific, from Australia, from even from the United States. And a lot of universities and wealthy people built these glass houses and they were primarily to maintain exotics during the winter and they would heat them. As time went on, they became more interested in providing better lighting in these exotic houses so the plants would not just survive, but thrive. And as time went by, the technology improved during the 18th and 19th centuries, all of the technology involved in construction is improving. We're using cast iron now, so we can build bigger structures, we can have bigger spans. We've figured out a way to make bigger pieces of glass. And so we end up by the mid 19th century, we've got these incredible glass houses at public exhibitions. Also for affluent people, they were building conservatories attached to their houses. And this is what we think of. We think of these beautiful Victorian conservatories that house tropical plants. I think there's a huge amount of romance in that. And I think it's something that attracts many people to greenhouses. And so that's a good example of this. This is this attached conservatory in England on a private home. So there are doors that led into the conservatory, which you can see is full of tropical plants. This is the billiard room, but the billiard table was on rails. So you could move it out of the way for when you had a ball. And so I consider, you know, often those sort of issues in planning my own home. And these are just pictures that I think are a range of the type of greenhouses that you'll see these days. Commercial greenhouses are very significant to our food production. So how do greenhouses work, really? I think it's obvious that the greenhouse being all glass or mostly glass is a heat trap. So the sun's rays come in and it heats the objects in the greenhouse. And then the heated objects uh, radiate heat to the air. So ventilation is a critical part of making your greenhouse work because you are going to have a lot of hot air in your greenhouse very quickly. You can't keep it all. It will cook your plants. It's like keeping the windows and doors closed on your car. Even on a cold day when you open it up, it's really hot. So that's why greenhouses have automatic vents. We say hot air rises, but in reality, cool air sinks. So we're going to be bringing cooler air off the ground into the bottom of the greenhouse and evacuating 
hot air out the top. And this is a cycle that happens every day, whether it's hot out or cold out. One of the things that makes greenhouses work, well, if you imagine, I'm talking about it gaining a lot of heat during the day, but at the same time, it is not an insulated building, or they can be insulated, but they're not insulated the way our houses are. So they heat up quickly, they lose heat quickly. So part of the game here is having enough thermal mass to retain the heat in your building. So this is the same idea as if you go out on your driveway or out in your street after a hot day, the night air is cooled off, but you can still feel the heat radiating from that masonry material because it has gained a lot more heat and it's radiating off of it. So one of the systems people use is some kind of a thermal mass, a masonry wall, a masonry floor, or these water barrels to retain that heat at night so it doesn't cool off too rapidly at night. You're also going to be concerned about where your house is located on your property because you want to maximize the amount of positive heat that you're going to get during the day. And you want to be concerned about the amount of heat you're going to lose at night. So an east-west orientation is ideal with the smaller ends towards the east and the west and the larger phase towards the south. In this diagram here, you see there are two arcs of the sun, and one is the shorter winter sun arc, and obviously this other one is the larger summer sun arc. So we get a lot more light during the day. It comes around a lot farther to the east and west. It is not ideal to put a greenhouse on the north side of a building. Eastern sunlight is acceptable. Western sunlight is acceptable. And south and southeast are ideal because the east sunlight is not as strong and hot. You don't really want western sun, long western sun will just heat up your greenhouse during the summer. And so you're gonna to have to deal with that in some way. Also, you wanna consider exactly where you might wanna locate this greenhouse in your yard. One of the problems with having the greenhouse on the north side of the house is that is where our winter weather comes from. Our summer prevailing winds are from the southeast and our winter prevailing winds are from the northwest. So you want to possibly provide a windbreak for it from the north and the west, which would provide shelter in the winter and shade in the summer. So deciduous trees would be great in the summer for some shade. And you want to avoid low areas. You may find in your garden, if you have low shady areas, they'll stay cool all the time because the cold air is sinking down there in pockets. Also, you have potential for it to be a drainage problem. This is maybe a unique problem to our area, but you have to know your zoning code. You have to know whether you are proposing to do an additional building on your property or is it not a building? So this is actually the house location survey of my own house on my lot. You should have a thing called a plat of survey that you got when you bought your house and it will show any building restriction lines on your property, you may have to go to your local zoning authority and find out what setback requirements. So in this property, I have building restriction line in the back because that is a resource protection area back there. Because in fact, I am in the drainage of a creek, which is out in the back. And now it's considered a floodplain and the city does not want me to build anything back there. And you're saying, but wait a minute, you have a shed back there. Well, I do have a shed back there. They do not consider it to be a building because it does not have a permanent foundation. So this is, again, may be an issue for you, may not be an issue for you, but you should know what the code requires. You don't want to get into a situation where you're building a greenhouse and you have somebody come along and say, you can't build it there because it is an addition to your building and we're now we're going to have to go through the whole zoning process. Be prepared, know in advance. Greenhouses can be attached or detached. 
And again, when they're attached, they're very convenient to the house. They're protected on one side. They are a fixed structure and they may be, again, you have to check with your local jurisdiction. They may be considered actual building addition to your house and will count in the square footage that's allowable on your lot. You will need a permanent foundation because you cannot attach it to the house without it being as stable as the house. You're going to need to protect your house from this new construction. You know, you don't want to get leaking and you don't want to have penetration problems or moisture problems or humidity problems in the house because of the greenhouse. Detached structures, they're very beautiful. I love this one. Obviously, I use this commercial picture of a greenhouse and it's out in the garden. I mean, obviously, it's next to the pool, too. But there are pros and cons to that. It is a freestanding building. This is going to need a really stable structure. This is a big and heavy building. And if it's away from your house, you have to think, how am I going to take care of it? Even if I have a system in there, am I going to feel confident in a snowstorm that it's performing okay? I'm going to have to go out and check on it. And I will tell you that in conversations with a longtime greenhouse professional, um, he said to me, you know, having a greenhouse is like having a child. You have to check on it all the time. You have to know what's going on with it and you need to check it every day. So if you locate it too far from your house, you might want to consider that. Also, freestanding structure is going to be more expensive to heat. There are pros and cons to each. So you have to consider how big you want your greenhouse to be. And I put these numbers in here as rules of thumb, and I just found these little plans online. But when you think about it, a planting bed is about two feet, possibly two foot six wide. You can't reach across a much bigger bed than that. You need to have clearance. You need to have adequate clearance to be working in this bed, to be reaching over. There's going to be stuff on the ground. You want to give yourself adequate clearance. For instance, the way this greenhouse is laid out, it's laid out two feet and not even two feet for clearance before the middle bed and about two feet on the other side. And this bed is a little bit narrower. Well, Overall, they've only got nine feet. If I were planning this greenhouse, I'd call it two feet, two feet, six, two feet, two feet, six, two feet. And I would end up with a 12 foot greenhouse because I think that clearance is as important as the space involved. If you want to have a sitting area or something, again, these are just rules of thumb. A couch is three feet deep. That's how deep it is. It can be longer, shorter, chairs, 24 by 24 is a good number to work with. And you've got to provide for clearances. Let people move around. They're going to move the furniture. So think about the overall size that you want. It'll impact cost. This section is about style. I wouldn't call these normal architectural styles. These are the styles that the greenhouse manufacturers call their products. This gable end, this is iconic small house. This is the way children draw a house. Um, they come in multiple types of framing, multiple types of glazing. These two at the top are aluminum. This one down here is steel. And they can be attached or detached and have that gable end style. Uh, you probably want to consider um, rain uh, that would shed off these roofs and where it would be going on your property to avoid erosion. You want to consider snow removal if that's a concern for you. You can see here that the vents are typically in the top, but they can also be on the end in this style. So this is what they call Gothic. And Gothic, uh, typically in design terms, means anything with a pointed arch, not rounded. And, and you can see this type of greenhouse does, in fact, have a pointed top. It's not rounded like a hoop house. This is a much more utilitarian style. It lends itself to the plastic glazing types which can bend easily around the frame. It's available in kit form. It requires a stable base because you can imagine, you can see here the force from the edges of the roof coming down like this. You're going to have to stabilize it somehow or brace it. It sheds snow very well and when we were preparing for this, one of my fellow presenters, Ann Coddington, said, why do you keep talking about snow? Because we don't have that much snow. And I'm like, well, 
We don't and we do. It can be the most damaging thing on a roof. So you get a lot of snow load on a roof. These structures are fragile. They're not intended to take a lot of load on the roof, very lightweight. And they could damage the plastic here in this case or damage the roof and cause the structure to collapse. It happens all the time in commercial greenhouses. So I think snow is a concern. There's Victorian, which these are so beautiful, very attractive. Unusual roof forms are possible, very decorative. These are probably the most expensive kind of greenhouses you can buy. And just in terms of their decorative nature, they will require more maintenance. They're beautiful. Look at that. Wouldn't you want that? Of course. And this is a, another style, the Quonset or Hoop House, which is very often used in for commercial greenhouses. This is one of our presenters, Liz, showing off her Hoop House, which she built herself, covered with a plastic polycarbonate. And they're very practical. And you can move them. They're very lightweight and stable, and you can move them yourself. And this is the last one, the Lean to or Single Slope. Actually, this is the type of greenhouse that my mother had in Connecticut when I was in high school. They can be freestanding. They're frequently attached to the side of a building. They will have to be tied to the building that they are attached to, but they do take advantage of being adjacent to the building. You can enter them from the building or from the outside, and they do have that advantage that we discussed earlier about having one side protected and you won't have any heat loss on that side. But if you have a roof above that, where you're going to have snow falling on the top of this, you really need to consult with whoever the manufacturer is and see if it can handle that load. I, I did an addition to a house once. They wanted to have a greenhouse type roof in their kitchen, and they did have another roof that regularly shed snow on that greenhouse. And we had to work with the manufacturer to make sure they had the structural capacity to take that load. And the last part of this section is in planning your greenhouse, you really need to think about what you're going to use it for. What do you want to grow? Is it more like a large cold frame? So you would keep it at a fairly cool temperature or all the way up to a tropical greenhouse that you're going to be heating in the winter and cooling in the summer to have your exotics in there. So the cool greenhouse is, as I said, sort of a grand cold frame. In our zone, it may not need heat. You might be able to have enough passive solar in the greenhouse to keep it above freezing overnight. We're just trying to not let anything freeze. You know, and these are getting more sophisticated every day. So it's just amazing. Look at these panels on these doors. Those are heat exchange panels, and they heat up during the day, close those doors at night, and they will give off heat to the space. Also, as we talked before, a lot of greenhouses have water barrels in them that heat up during the day and release heat at night. And the same is true of having a masonry wall on those sides of the greenhouse where they will heat up. You can keep cold, hardy vegetables in there, the same as you would in a cold frame. You grow spinach during the winter, certainly in this climate. And in the spring, you're going to be able to start all of your vegetables early. If you're going to put non-hardy plants in there, you're going to have to consider having heat. The temperate greenhouse is a little bit warmer. You're going to keep it around 40 degrees at night. Tender plants will survive through the winter. Plants may not bloom or increase, but they will be fine out there. You will still need ventilation because it will heat up during the winter. And these will get hot. Most greenhouses come with an automatic vent that is a wax cylinder, so it doesn't require power or maintenance. And you can start cold weather vegetables during the winter and summer vegetables during the spring and maintain some tender houseplants. A warmer greenhouse is just going to be warmer. If you could keep it at 55 to 60 degrees at night, that's ideal for like many plants that bloom, like geraniums and some orchids. And you can keep citrus trees in a greenhouse that stays at that temperature. And you will need heat, definitely heat and ventilation all the time year round. 
And then obviously in the spring, you know, your tropical plants will flourish. But during the summer, you're going to have to really probably have proactive ventilation and some kind of shading. If you're going to keep plants in it, and I think that that's one of the things that our speakers today are going to talk about is that they don't really keep plants in the greenhouse in the summer because it is too hot. So here's everybody's dream, a tropical greenhouse. You probably are going to want to insulate the floors, insulate the walls to the extent possible because it's going to be expensive to heat an outdoor space to 60 to 70 degrees all winter long. Again, you're going to have a lot of heat gain during the day, but it will dissipate quickly if it's cold outside. You can imagine that. But it's beautiful. You keep your tropical plants in there, and then you have to move them outside during the summer because it's going to be too hot. Okay, so what is your greenhouse going to be made of? Well, framing materials typically include wood, steel, aluminum, and plastic. And the glazing materials are glass, polycarbonate sheet, acrylic, multi-walled polycarbonate, or plastic. You need to be aware of the qualities of each one of these materials and that they do react differently to heat, cold, humidity, and moisture. You can have a greenhouse made out of wood. They're not uncommon. You can get plans for them. You can build them yourself with home tools. It is a precision thing. You want to be careful about your connections to your glazing so that you will allow the wood to be moved to move to shrink and in the humidity around here certainly expand. And the other thing is that any wood that you've got exposed on the exterior of a structure is going to need maintenance. You no know, matter what kind of sealant you put on it, it's going to need maintenance. Aluminum is probably the most common material you're going to see in a greenhouse that you would buy as a kit. You buy them pre-made as kits. They come with all the parts cut to your house. You can assemble them yourself. If you get them either anodized or powder coated, finish on the aluminum, it's basically maintenance free. They are light. They're very light structure. You would need to attach it to a base somehow to make it three-dimensionally structurally stable. And there are all kinds of design styles that are available with aluminum framing. They're not inexpensive. Steel greenhouses are like aluminum, but they're more robust. And they're either in places where people are very concerned about things like snow load, or they have longer spans. They can do a bigger greenhouse. But you can see in these photographs and these images that the greenhouse members themselves are beefier. The lower one is made out of the same small members that we use in commercial construction. And they're galvanized. You see how frequent they are and how they're cross-braced at the corner to make them stable. But it would be an economical way to do it. The thing about steel is it's bigger, it's more robust. You should have to get it powder-coated or galvanized. They need a more robust footing or foundation. And here's our friend, the PVC framed greenhouse, very lightweight. You know what PVC piping looks like. You probably have some in your house. But you can use it as a structural framing member. They make connections for this. You're going to see this in Liz's greenhouse. Mostly they're done in this hoop style. But you could also make one with a gable end. They're low maintenance. They're lightweight. In my mind, they'd seem more fragile. And I'd be concerned about wind load on them. But Liz says hers is great. Stable doesn't move, so we're all good. So glazing. Well, I guess we all think of greenhouses as having glass glazing. And certainly, I'm going to say up until 20 years ago, that was what you did when you had a greenhouse. But the plastics have come a long way, as we all know, and they come in a lot of different forms with a lot of different names. Essentially, there's polycarbonate, which comes in sheets. It comes in these insulated forms. Those can be several layers thick. And I did a structure at the 
campus of the community college in Loudoun, where we built a little building out of these. And it had its own system that fit with that kind of polycarbonate framing or acrylic. And glass, this is the gold standard, right? It's the most durable, it's heaviest, it's the highest cost, it has the best light transmission. Acrylic then probably is the second. It's lightweight, it doesn't yellow, can be easily modified in the field depending on the design issues. It is easily scratched. The connections have to acknowledge that it has a high coefficient of expansion. That's just a detailing question. And the light transmission is very high. Polycarbonate, it can be multi-walls. It's not as transparent. It's scratch resistant, certainly. It's lightweight and it's easy to work with. And the light transmission is just not as good. So you also have to consider services. You're going to be wanting to bring water and power to your greenhouse. Now, a lot of people will tell you that rainwater is best for your greenhouse plants, the same it is best for your uh, outdoor plants. You could put in some kind of a cistern or rain barrel and use gravity drainage to bring water into your greenhouse, which is a little example of that, just going right through the wall. You could use domestic water from your house, so from a hose bib or from your house. Um, it would be temporary. It's simple and expensive. You can put it on a water system and control it by a timer. You're going to have to remember that you're going to have to drain these out during the winter. Hoses could be difficult to manage. Or you could have, of course, the gold standard where you actually bring domestic water to your greenhouse, which would be lovely. But again, doing something like that is going to trigger your local co-officials to think this is a permanent building. So if I'm putting up a greenhouse and I'm bringing permanent power to it and I'm bringing permanent water to it, they're going to go, uh-oh, you're going to turn this into an Airbnb. You're just bootlegging it in as a greenhouse, but I know you have other plans for it. They would not be pleased with that. So water distribution one of the beautiful things about the popularity of greenhouses today is there are a huge number of systems available for water distribution. You can buy them online, drip irrigation. You can hook them up to a, a timer or to any kind of automatic system that's available that can be overhead. You have to be careful, of course, with overhead irrigation as it can damage the leaves of your plants and may encourage fungus in the greenhouse. Remember, a, a greenhouse is a semi-closed environment. It's not completely open. So whatever watering system you're considering, you have to manage it. You have to be aware of it, or you will end up with a problem in the greenhouse. So don't forget about drainage, because if you're putting water into the greenhouse, you've got to get it out. This image at the top left-hand corner is the underground pipe that is daylighting out into their yard. They're going to get the water out that way. In this other image, the flooring is porous. So they've got a thick layer of gravel, take a lot of water, which will eventually dissipate either around the edges or into the soil below. And both of these are examples of kind of a trench drain, which drain out of the building at some point. So the permeable flooring lead to a trench drain to dry well or uh, are daylighted outside. But you wanna make sure that any water you're bringing in can get out or you will have a humidity problem. And you can use domestic power. I think that's what most people are gonna do. They're gonna just tap to an outside power source that they have and run cords. But the cords are a nuisance in your yard. It depends on how far away your building is from your house and how you're able to protect the cords or conceal them, you could also run out permanent domestic power to your house. A greenhouse is an alternative power source, but you always need to really consider, are you going to have adequate backup power? Because cold will kill, heat will damage plants. But cold, outright cold, will kill them. So you can use passive solar panels, but they don't work very well when it's cold and snowy out. 
we've talked about ways where you can hold the heat that is coming in from the sun in the greenhouse, but also, you know, you have three cold, snowy days in the middle of winter. You might want to consider that even under those circumstances, you may want to have some kind of backup power. Lighting is a huge opportunity in a greenhouse. I'm thinking about somebody who wants to grow tomatoes in February. Well, certainly you could provide enough heat to grow tomatoes in February, but you've still got to have the right amount of light. So you're going to have to supplement the amount of light that goes to those spaces. Luckily, since LEDs have become so popular and they come in color temperatures that are appropriate for plant growth, it's very simple to install LED lights and they're inexpensive in your greenhouse. And you can have them on a timer. You can adjust their height above the plants for optimal growth. You just figure out how much light you need for whatever it is you want to grow at that time of the year, put in a light system and put it on a timer. But again, you have to plan for backup power. I don't know about you, but we lose power all the time. And every time we do, I swear to God, I'm getting a generator and then the power comes back on and we don't get one. So there we are. So heat's kind of the same thing. It's very similar to heating a house. You could use any kind of system in your greenhouse that you could use in heating your house. It can be powered by propane, gas, electric. You could have it under floor rating up. Very popular in commercial greenhouses to have the heat under the benches. because They can control the temperature of the actual material that the plants are growing in. So and that can be on a thermostat, providing exactly the heat. Your tomatoes aren't going to germinate in your garden until the, it gets to be 70 degrees. You want to germinate tomatoes in a greenhouse in February, you're going to provide that heat to the soil where they're germinating. You can get heaters that hang from the ceiling. You can get heaters that sit on the floor that are on low temperatures alarm in your house. I would be concerned about the fire potential of a unanchored heater. You know, you be the judge where you're going to put it in your greenhouse and how much you're going to be running it. Fans and ventilation are crucial to the performance of the greenhouse. You can have fans associated with ventilators in the wall or in the roof. They are, can be thermostatically controlled. And again, we talked about cold air coming in at the bottom and taking hot air off the top. So if here's a typical roof vent open, but if you have a fan associated with that vent, it's gonna move that heat out a lot faster. It's like having a whole house air conditioner. It's gonna pull that cold air up off the ground. And most commercial greenhouses have fans in them that move the air around because they optimize the overall temperature of the room. So you can get with cool air coming in at the bottom, if the vents aren't open because it's not very hot out, you're gonna get stratified air. So you have cool air at the bottom, it feels warm in there, so it's not triggering a temperature control, but where your plants are down on the ground, it may be quite cool. So fans help you maintain the overall ambiance in the greenhouse. And you got to consider that you're going to have insects and predators and disease. Whatever's going on out in your garden, your greenhouse is not that protected from it. So you want to keep your plants healthy. You need to know their light water and fertilizer requirements. I find that people often just do not know. They're fine with watering and fertilizing plants, but they don't know a plant's light requirements. And if it's not getting enough light, it is not going to thrive. I want you to be vigilant about quarantining any new plants before you introduce them to your greenhouse. The one problem that my mother had in her greenhouse, which was in Connecticut, was during the winter when she got a very, very bad case of white fly. She could not get rid of it. She ended up having to remove all the plants from her greenhouse. And we're talking about eight foot tall Norfolk Island pines and huge tropical plants and she had to find another greenhouse who would take them temporarily and quarantine them and get rid of the insects on them so she could have the greenhouse fumigated. It was not the happiest winter in my mother's house. 
So be vigilant. You need to check your plants, see what's going on, make sure they're doing well. And remember, if you find any kind of insects on or fungus on your plants, you want to check the BCE pest management guide to see what the most appropriate treatment would be. Also, you need to be aware that other things want to get into your greenhouse. Birds would like to live there, and it's kind of awkward when they build their nests there. You don't want to have attractive food sources in the greenhouse. Mice can do a lot of damage. They may consider things food sources that you hadn't really considered, so you want to be very proactive about that. A lot of commercial greenhouses we use a pre-emergence fungus treatments, also, you can consider inclusion of beneficial insects if you know that you will need them at appropriate times. But the proactive effort is probably the most important thing because, as we said before, your greenhouse is like a child. You need to be aware of what's going on with it every day to take good care of it. So I have down here, neem oil is not good in all applications. This is because my daughter-in-law's father got like a five gallon container of neem oil. And anytime anything went wrong in their garden, he was like the father in uh, my big fat Greek wedding who put Windex on everything. He was like, well, let's use neem oil. And I'm like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. let's find out if this is the right application for that before we do it. He had five gallons. He was going to use it. Also, most greenhouses that are kits come with accessories. And I think that this is something you really seriously want to consider the value of that. You can see here in this little, I'm going to call it demonstration greenhouse because clearly not a real setup as a greenhouse, but it has shelves that fit into the system. Um, Anne has one that fits into the system in her house. You can bring in freestanding equipment or you can buy shelves to go along the walls to hold things, but also they come with uh, little shelves and things and, and hooks that you can hang things from. So it, it is an overall system. You want to keep heavy things on the ground because remember this is a lightweight structure. You don't want to be loading the canopy with a lot of heavy things that so increases its vulnerability to wind load. Questions? We had one comment about growing tomatoes, starting them in water without a greenhouse. I don't know if you've had any experience or seen that. One of the things you can do, and I didn't go into it, I was trying to do a really basic class for people who are trying to choose a greenhouse. You can have a hydroponic system in your greenhouse. This is what commercial growers do. They grow their plants without soil and all the plants, nutrition and everything is provided. There are people who will help you do a hydroponic greenhouse. I don't want to be promoting individual businesses, but I will say I live in the city of Falls Church. There is a business here, and that's what the guy does. He does hydroponic greenhouses. He helps people do greenhouses over wall, but really his business is greenhouse supplies and hydroponic systems. So you should look online and see what's available if you're interested in that. These are the case studies, and our first case study, the presenter is Liz Crowley. Thank you, Beth. I appreciate all that you've gone through, Beth. I dreamed of having a greenhouse for a decades and researched them. And I think you did a really good job of presenting the different options. And I was afraid I was going to order a greenhouse kit and not build it. I perhaps didn't buy the most beautiful greenhouse, but I am very happy with the greenhouse that I have and built. And I'm glad I actually jumped into owning a greenhouse. My greenhouse is generally a temperate greenhouse. I could easily bring it up to not maybe tropical, but subtropical. I do have a passive solar aspect. I do have uh, five gallon containers of water in there. So it, it's pretty versatile. It's also very portable. And I do have it oriented on the east west so that uh, the smallest, it is an eight foot by eight foot. So you wouldn't really think you needed to orient it, but the ends are a little bit smaller square footage than the long end as far as the sun meeting the orientation of the greenhouse. I do have a fair amount of trees overhead and it's mostly unprotected on the west side. So that's not ideal in the summer, hence why it's not a great summer greenhouse. 
have lost heat a couple of times. So I found out that most houseplants do make it through. They might lose all their top growth, but most of them, my houseplants have survived it. There were only a few that didn't bounce back. Coleus, for instance, and African violets will not make it through a very cold night. And then there is a worm bin, which makes it possible to compost through the winter very quickly, especially if you keep it warmer. As I said, you do need shade for it. And I would definitely shade the west side as more than I have maybe in this picture, which would be the, the side with the blue pails on it. You can see the inside construction here. It's made out of the PVC pipe. And I believe those are aluminum connectors. The railings are very strong and I can hang light fixtures off of it and hanging plants. I believe it could withstand a uh, snow load because most of the snow would slide off. They show people standing on it in some of the brochures. And it only took two people to construct it. I did probably 90% of it, and I'm over 50. And I only had to get my 20-year-old son to help at the last minute with moving it and squaring it up and putting the long panels over the top. So it's, uh, it's a great structure. I didn't like the fact that I was going to have not clear panels, but I really enjoy the light, the diffused light that it gives. It also prevents burning of plants. Clear panels can magnify and burn your leaves of your plants. And it also kind of means that there's really no spot in the greenhouse that's really shaded. It, 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 there's just a suffused glow throughout the whole thing. And then my flooring is a tarp that drains water, but it keeps it cleaner in there. So that's a good thing too. And at first, I had kind of it tied down to some of my pails of water to make sure it didn't fly off, but I've removed that. The wind doesn't seem to shake it at all. I've had it, I think, up into like 70 mile per hour winds in the last three years. And I originally had only one heater and that was able to take care of everything, but now I have two electric heaters in there just to bring up the temperature and keep it more moderate through the winter. And I have extension cords to those heaters. And I can remotely monitor the temperature from my house without going out there. In winter, you want to not open the door when it's 20 degrees out because then you're bringing 20 degree temperature immediately to your plants, especially the ones close to the door. So it's nice to know what the temperature is remotely so that you don't have to open the door and find out what it is. And I have to drag a hose to it to water things, which is problematic because it's across my lawn. So I have to reel the hose in when my husband wants to mow the lawn. I got tired of the birds taking up residence in it. So I try to discourage the flight path with the cloth there in the windows. And mice is an ongoing problem. Cardboard, don't put cardboard in your greenhouse. They like to chew on things. And if you keep it cleaner, then they can't find places to house themselves in. Slugs are a problem too, because they can find their way in. And I have some gigantic slugs. So greenhouse gardening is not for the squeamish. The biggest challenge with building it was that the ends of the panels are fluted, and so you need to caulk them. Uh, otherwise, moisture gets in there and turns moldy, and I was not as good at caulking. I'd never done caulking a lot before and got impatient with it, so I didn't do that as well. And the other challenge was I didn't live near my greenhouse for three years, so I could only visit it about once a week, which is probably the minimum you can get away with your plants not drying out from being watered and finding out that you lost power for the past four days. Those were some of the issues that I encountered not monitoring it every day. I really enjoyed building it as a structural engineer. I usually just design things to be built. I don't usually build them. That was fun to be able to build it. Also, I love house plants, and it opened up a whole new group of house plants that require cooler temperatures during winter and more light during winter. So that was fun too. And I really wanted a worm bin, but it, my husband did not want it in the house. So the greenhouse is a good place for a worm bin. And the sunny time in the winter is great. I enjoy being in the sunshine, unobstructed, and the peace and quiet there with my plants.
and the translucent panels do hide any messiness in there. So that's good if you're not the neatest person. I'm not the neatest person. If I had to choose differently, Beth actually showed the model in a previous slide that has the straight up sides. I would go with that one. It's a little bit taller and the straight up sides are easier to put shelving in. And I would caulk more carefully. And I would enjoy permanent water and power, but yes, that means the location becomes permanent and it does mean that it might be considered a permanent building. Uh, an eight foot by eight foot greenhouse, especially one that you can move around. I don't think you would have any problem putting that in your garden. And it's a nice size for a third of an acre. Anything larger might dominate your backyard too much. Thanks, Liz. That was great. I'm going to turn it over to Anne now. This is, as you see, a temperate greenhouse, and this one is six feet by eight feet. When we decided to get a greenhouse, the goals were housing tender plants in the winter and propagating cuttings and starting seeds for the spring planting. And it's worked out nicely. Also, we created a sheltered outdoor living space, which has been more of a joy than ever anticipated, especially during the cold and cooler months. For the location, we oriented the greenhouse where we could put it. It's not necessarily in the ideal spot, but it's where it needs to be in the backyard on the existing patio. And that was just the choice made by the options we had. The greenhouse is attached to four inch by four inch timbers, and they're simply placed on the patio. Our non hardy plants like geraniums and container plants spend the summers outside, and then we'll bring them into the greenhouse for the winter. As you can see here, this is what we got. This greenhouse was bought online actually in 2020. All of our components were delivered in one box and we put it together outside in the back where the greenhouse was going to be. The heater and thermostat that you see here were recommended by the manufacturer and so we purchased those as well. This small electric heater has a built-in fan, which has several settings. One is non-heat, and then there's low to high heat. And it has powered by just the outside power with an extension cord that we ran into the greenhouse. Don't tell the county. I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if that's allowed, but we did it. The thermostat that you see here is between the power connection and the heater. And that's a great little device that has a temperature control and a course timer. We placed some five gallon water containers to reduce heat loss. And if you can see that vented window at the top, that comes open when it's too hot and it closes when it's cool. It works pneumatically with a cylinder of wax and it's a miracle. We get the water from the hose and bring it in in watering cans and in the cold months we check the heat at night and I love the idea of having the digital thermometer. We may invest in that in the future. And excuse my mess, this is my summer garden and you can see here where the power is and we put a little hole and the power goes in and we've raised up on bricks and a piece of plywood to put the heater. There's no water problem, but just in case I don't want water on electricity. Also, we put in there a surge protector extension power. Okay, so it is attached. There's no foundation. It's just on, just set on the patio. You could literally lift it up. The, the greenhouse is attached with screws to four inch by four inch pieces of wood. Some people call them railroad ties. The aluminum frame and polycarbonate windows came flat packed. It took two people to assemble it. However, one person can do a whole lot. It takes two people for setting the walls and 
the door because you need an extra set of hands. But we did not require any professional help, which was kind of amazing. The biggest challenge, of course, keeping it square. So use a level and be patient with yourself. Our walls are actually polycarbonate, not acrylic, but I double check that. And they're clear. I have no problem seeing out. I actually enjoy seeing out. And when it does get sunshine in there that's way too hot in the spring or summer, if it's just beating down and I would like to be in there, sometimes I'll hang a sheet over the top of the greenhouse and it makes a little shade and I'm fine. There are lots of accessories. I have one shelf in the corner, which is a professional accessory, and I would like to have more because they're very neat and they look nice. And of course, the flooring is just the patio, so the, the water seems to drain. I have no problems. And the biggest challenges is the initial cost. Ah, you know, anything over $1,000, but it was worth it. And I would not balk at the cost after experiencing the greenhouse maintenance. We hose it off in the summer when you get that thick yellow pollen on everything. We blow it out with the blower. Sometimes we'll sweep it a little bit. <clears throat> And then maintaining humidity has been my biggest challenge. Uh, the more plants, the more humidity. It's just something that I'm working on. The benefits, there's so many benefits from having a greenhouse. I found it to be a barrier from most pests, but then again, I'm on a flat flagstone surface. I'm not on grass. So maybe I get less pests because of that. I have seen one mouse in the years of having a greenhouse and I don't know who was more scared. So the biggest benefits besides human interest and everybody loves it and is that it is the barrier. We have our worm composting in there. It's a little hospital for our sick plants or house plants to get hardy before coming in. It has become an extra place for work from home office for meditation, for thinking, for drawing and creating and doing art. We added fairy lights or the Christmas lights to the top. And at night, it just adds magic. I was out there last night and just thinking about this project. And I guess I was the plant in the greenhouse. I have no regrets. If you ever have any questions, I'd be more than happy to let you come see mine or talk to you about it, but I will say that putting it together in the box, it comes in order of the pieces and how you put them together. The instructions were all graphic, no text. They have an 800 number that you can call. They probably have YouTube tutorial videos. So you're gonna have a lot of help out there from either the manufacturer of your greenhouse or from somebody on YouTube that's done it themselves. And there's a hundred thousand different ways to do it. But this is the six by eight from Amazon solution. And thank you for your time. Thanks, Anne. So do we have questions from that session, Nicole? Yes, we do. Uh, we have a question about the source of Liz's greenhouse. So mine came from Solex, S-O-L-E-X-X. -X. Solex greenhouses, they are sold by a couple of people. I'm not sure if Amazon is one of them, but after COVID, I think all greenhouses got a little harder to find if they're for a bit. And mine's called the early bloomer, I think. Good name. All right. Thanks, Liz. And then, um, Anne, just confirming, it looks like from the screenshot, you ordered yours from Amazon. Is that right? We did. I was just looking to check to see the materials that it's made out of because it is the polycarbonate windows. And I also noticed from being on Amazon just now, um, there are a lot more choices than there were in 2020. With a six by eight greenhouse, is there room for your plants and office and meditation space? Well, I'm not laying down to meditate. <laughs> Part of me wants to clear everything out and put in a little hanging. I mean, I want it more for me than even the plants, but we have an old table and it's maybe a little big for the space, but we have a big sort of work table in there and a folding chair and 
it just it's kind of like a kitchen table with shelves on the side and then I just want to clarify with your greenhouse because I know that you said that it's from Amazon do you remember the exact model name p-a-l-r-a-m and and it's harmony okay but like I said um amazing choices out there and there's plenty of places online to purchase them from it's just amazon was where we settled well so there's one little piece on the end here which is sort of an extension of the romance of the greenhouse as i said i was concerned that this presentation was running long so i thought well if people don't have time and they have to leave maybe they're not as much in love with greenhouses as buildings as i am and may not be architects longwood gardens i think many people are familiar with Longwood Gardens in Pennsylvania. They already have many greenhouses. They are doing a big addition by the architects Weissman Friedi out of New York. This is going to be a huge 32,000 square foot greenhouse addition. So it's a little bit bigger than what you put in your backyard. It's also, you can kind of see it in this drawing. It's all on water. The whole thing is connected little islands in water that underlies the whole greenhouse. And these are uh, sections through the greenhouse and sort of some diagrams showing it at different times of the year and an image of what the architects thought it would look like. I was up there in May and it is under construction. Oh, and you can see in the background, this is the older greenhouse components in the background. It is on the other side of what was a big area that had all of their lily ponds. I think that's going to be redone, that the lily ponds will be back. So it's on that end of the building. So you walk through this other greenhouse buildings to get down to this end. It's under construction. Beautiful lines of the steel framing that are supporting the roof and the complicated roofs. And then, of course, it will just be these imagined tropical greenhouses on these floating islands. It's supposed to open in 2024. They were saying at the end of the summer, the docent that I talked to said they're hoping to have it done by the end of the summer, but they certainly will have it done by Christmas because they've got a bunch of events scheduled for it at Christmas time in 2024. So if you love greenhouse, if you are excited by the whole romance of the greenhouse, visit Longwood Gardens and see what's going on. The last thing I want to say is we are the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. We're volunteers. We're here to help you with any of your gardening needs. And I want to particularly direct you to our website, mgnv.org. It is a wealth of information of all kinds of gardening. And there are certainly more classes available. When you go to our website, Please consider making a donation to MGNB. Every dollar that you donate, we are a 501c3, it's tax deductible, and every dollar goes back into all of our efforts to help people become gardeners and become better gardeners. Happy gardening. Yes, thank you, Beth. Thanks, Liz. Thank you, Anne. Thank everyone for joining us this Friday. Have a wonderful weekend. Happy gardening.